This is Dr. Rachel Coleman. Welcome to another episode of Be In Health. You know, nowadays we hear a lot about addiction, about people overdosing on heroin or prescription, prescription pain medications. Well, what is it really all about? Today we will be talking with prominent psychiatrist Dr. Emmett Cooper. He's been in practice in the greater Cincinnati area for more than 38 years. He'll be talking with us about addiction, so please stay tuned. I'm here with Dr. Emmett Cooper. He's a graduate of Howard University. He is the first MD, PhD graduate of their program. He has been in practice for more than 38 years after being a researcher with the National Institutes of Health. And also, he has done a fellowship in psychosomatic disorders. Welcome to the show, Dr. Cooper. Can you tell us a little more about yourself? Well, as you mentioned, I went to uh, school at Howard University, uh, undergrad, grad school, and medical school. Uh, I spent a year in California uh, doing a medical internship after uh, medical school. I spent two years at the National Institutes of Health uh, doing clinical research and uh, research evaluation. And I spent most of my uh, professional career as a psychiatrist doing uh, general psychiatric treatment and opioid dependency treatment. So today we're going to talk about addiction. How do people become addicted? They become addicted by practicing. Uh, in life we all change, we change every day, and we change into what we practice. People who become addicted have been practicing using medications to adjust the way that they feel. They do it every day, they come up with justifications for it every day, they become very good at doing it, and they continue to do it until they begin to practice something else. So opioids in, in particular, uh, is the problem on the rise? I think that it is. Um, at least the awareness is certainly on, on the rise. Um, the introduction of pharmaceuticals um, uh, lends quality control to it. When you buy heroin off the street, uh, there's a term, it's called stepped on, it's, it's cut. It's cut with a variety of medications, uh, decreasing its potency. When you buy a pharmaceutical, you're guaranteed what you pay for. So if, a, if an addict wants to buy 40 milligrams, they can order a 40 milligram tablet and they know that they're getting 40 milligrams of the medication. Whereas with heroin, if you buy what you think is a gram of heroin, it might end up being a half of a gram of heroin and a half of a gram of, of benzodiazepines or cocaine or sugar or any, any uh, contaminant that the uh, seller is willing to uh, put into the mix. Okay. What are some of the misconceptions regarding addiction? Okay. Well, to get back to your earlier question first, uh, you said it's on the rise. I, I, I think that the perception is that it's on the rise because the perception that it is just an inner city problem has been challenged by reality. When we see celebrities that are middle class and upper class overdosing and dying, we can no longer say that this is just an inner city or minority problem. So I think the fact that through social media and through communication in general, uh, the awareness that people are using, abusing, and dying from opiates has made it uh, uh, more part of our collective consciousness. Um, uh, but, but if you look at the literature, um, people have become addicted to something uh, since man first started um, fermenting beer and wine. Uh, there seems to be a natural inclination for humans to want to escape the bonds of reality from time to time. And the real addiction is not a particular drug. The real addiction is wanting and being able to change the way that you feel whenever you want to feel that particular way. Other common misconceptions? Okay. Um, misconceptions is that people who are addicted may have some sort of moral defect. It, they really don't. Uh, what, the way one becomes addicted can occur in a number of ways. Uh, you can have what's called iatrogenic addiction where someone uh, has never been addicted or never had any serious problems with drugs and has uh, sustained an injury or a fracture or some sort of surgery that's been treated with a pharmaceutical uh, intervention. Uh, and if you take the medication long enough, you can build a tolerance to it so that you have to take more of the same medication to get the same response. And there comes a point in time where the body uh, develops a dependence on that medication to function normally, to feel normally. And so if you stop taking it, once you reach that point, there is a significant and prolonged withdrawal syndrome 
that the person experiences. With opiates, it can be diarrhea and nausea and vomiting and uh, chills and fever, uh, headaches, uh, tearing and lacrimation, a number of very uncomfortable and dysphoric experiences. And so what drives most addicts to seek drugs is not that they're still trying to get high. What they're trying to do is avoid being sick. And uh, many of the interventions that we now use are used to uh, prevent them from becoming sick so that we can work with them to change the way that they make decisions and think and, 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 uh, and use medications. Is there a certain appearance or can we easily uh, detect an, an addict? You can't. An addict can look like anyone. Um, I've been I've run a couple of programs, a methadone program, two or three of them actually, uh, and a suboxone program and other drug treatment programs. And I'd say the average addict is a uh, white male or female between the ages of 20 and 40, and usually middle class. So it's not just an inner city problem. Um, at my private program uh, here at uh, Health Experiences, um, I would say 95% of our clients are white, middle class, males or females between the ages of 20 and 40. It's not to say that it doesn't affect everyone, but it is to say that you can't look at a person and determine whether or not they are, are addicted or whether they're capable of becoming addicted. Virtually anyone who's subjected to medication for a long enough period of time will develop at least a physical dependence and a significant number will develop a psychological dependence as well. So if a person who is addicted to an opioid would want to get help, how do they get help? Well, it's a complicated question because many folks, uh, a major part of any addiction is denial that you're addicted in the first place. And so if there's nothing wrong, there's no motivation to fix it. Uh, if, the, if you're fortunate enough to have a person who recognizes that, one, they are addicted, and that, two, they have a role in sustaining their, or maintaining their addiction, uh, they can get help in a number of organizations, both private and public. Uh, you can always get online and, and Google treatments. Um, in Cincinnati, uh, there are at least 30 or 40 um, uh, agencies or doctors that will prescribe um, medication-assisted treatment with Suboxone or Subutex or Vivitrol uh, uh, or Methadone. And again, it's important to recognize that medication does what medication does. It, it prevents them from feeling sick. It does not change the way that they think. It does not change the way that they make decisions. And so it's the, it's the, the responsibility of the counselor, of the doc, of the medical staff to act as a change agent and uh, assist the client in changing the way he or she uses medications, uh, changes the way that they make decisions generally so that uh, they make decisions that are consistent with their health and not decisions that are just solely based on how they feel at the moment. And, and that's true not just of substance abuse, that's true for many medical illnesses such as diabetes, type 2 diabetes in particular, uh, uh, COPD, uh, high blood pressure, uh, uh, many of the metab metabolic syndromes. Uh, those things, those conditions are developed or at least exacerbated by the decisions that clients make, not the doctor's office, but every day of their lives. Mm -hmm. Whether they eat correctly, whether they exercise correctly, whether they use the right medications in the right manner, those are the results of their decisions, not just uh, bad luck. Mm -hmm. So I think it is critical that once the person recognizes that they are in a cycle of making bad decisions, then they can usually tell it because a true addict his or her whole day, it revolves around and is organized around drugs. They go to bed at night thinking about drugs, they wake up in the morning thinking about drugs, they chase them all day long, they spend money that they don't have, they lie to people about what they're doing, they steal from family and friends. Uh, they do this every day, but it becomes such a part of their, um, of their daily activity, they don't understand how uh, uh, destructive it is to them and to their families. So if, if a person uh, recognizes that they have a problem and seeks treatment, uh, there are a lot of different approaches and, and it's beyond the scope of this uh, program today to get into the different philosophies, but most of them involve an increased awareness of what the person's triggers are, and what biological or psychological or situational uh, events make them think about drugs and make it more likely that they will use drugs. Can you give some examples of those triggers? Some mm -hmm. possible triggers. Right. For, for some people, it might be uh, pain or discomfort. 
Uh, for some people it might be boredom or depression. For some people it might be uh, in the company of other folks that they've used with. Or it might be in a certain part of town where they've used. Uh, I've heard clients describe certain smells, certain songs on the radio will trigger them. And, and so there's usually, there are usually a, a variety of biological, psychological, and situational triggers that uh, that client associates with drug use. And it's important that we try to help them identify all of them, and we do that by having them journal uh, when they use or when they, they're thinking about using. And then we try to develop a support system of people that they can call uh, or some alternate activities that, that they can um, uh, employ at, as, as opposed to using drugs. Um, you know, we, we usually have them journal um, uh, a, in an ongoing way what their day is like. Um, when someone is thinking about using, they have a number of junctures, any, at any which of which, it, they have a number of junctures that would allow them to make a different decision and change the course of, of their actions. For instance, when they first think about it, they would say, wait a minute, do I really want to use, or should I call someone and help them walk me through, or should I, should I call my sponsor, should I call my counselor? Then they have to get the money together. Another juncture where they could make the decision to continue down the path toward procuring and using drugs, or they could use one of our uh, relapse prevention strategies. Then they have to make the phone call. Then they have to, to meet with the person. Uh, then they have to uh, get the paraphernalia together. Then they, if it's an IV use, they have to cook it up and, and uh, drain it through, a, through a, um, a filter or a piece of cotton. So there are a number of points. It's not just that I'll, they think about using one second and they're using the next second. It's usually not that easy. There's usually minutes to, to hours between the time they think about it and the time they actually use. So we, we try to do what's called cognitive rehearsal with them so that they can anticipate what some of those things some of those circumstances are, and they can practice what they're saying to themselves about what the next step is, and we try to insert in there somewhere, get, your, get to your relapse prevention plan, call someone on the phone, get online on one of the 24-7 chat rooms, do something other than continuing the path that leads to recidivism and using, and get back on the path that will allow you to uh, avoid using and respond differently to your trigger. And as I said earlier, that None of us has any choice as to whether we change. We all change every day. The choice comes as what we change into, and you change into what you practice. And so we want these people to begin practicing the things that are on their relapse prevention uh, plan, rather than practicing coming up with a justification to do drugs one more time. Justifications are things like, uh, I've been good for a couple of days, it, it couldn't hurt, just do a little piece today. Um, uh, this pain is getting worse, I'll just do enough until the pain goes away. Um, I'm just going to do this on the weekends. Um, a number of, 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 of pseudo-rationalizations that they employ to, to make it okay, I'm going to stop tomorrow. You know, uh, people do this with drugs, they do, do it with alcohol, they do it with cigarette smoking, they do it with food. It's, it's, it's the, the constant struggle between in our decision making between how I want to feel right now versus what I want to become and what I want my life to become a week from now, a month from now, a year from now. And the more they can base their decision making on the healthy redefinition of themselves and, and the life they want to live rather than on how they're feeling right now or how they want to feel right now, the more likely they are to make health, healthy decisions and become the person that they redefine. So what if a, a person has a family member that's addicted? Is there something that can be done to help uh, the, the family member? Um, yeah, I think uh, there are programs like Narcanon and Al-Anon that will teach the family member about what addiction is. Uh, what doesn't work is to try to shame the person, mm -hmm. you know, and compare them to someone else in the family. Uh, uh, the couple, people know what they're doing. Uh, they may apply denial to it, but they know that the first thing they do in the morning is to think of drugs. They know that if family's talking about going on vacation, they'll come up with a hundred reasons why they can't go, because they can't be sure they're going to have access to their drugs. Uh, I tell a lot of my clients that on the first day I see them that if I told you you just want a trip to Hawaii, you couldn't even go. And they'll say, you're right, because the first thing I think about is how will I get my dope over there? How will I get through customs? And so, 
you know, they, they recognize that the family members can't shame them into it. What they need to recognize is that it is an illness and you want them to get into treatment and for different people that means different things. It, but, but I think first it means demonstrating that you understand what they're going through and how difficult it is. You know, I, I, there are probably a million stories where a mother will tell me, I've been telling him he's got to stop doing those drugs and the whole time she's got a cigarette in her hand smoking. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, and she can't see the, that the, the same thing that she's complaining about her son's doing, she's doing. She's using a drug to make her feel a certain way and denying in the face of all the medical evidence that's just killing her, she still says, I can do one more, I'll quit next week. So, you know, with that kind of internal inconsistency, it, it, uh, it just gives the, the, uh, the identified patient one more reason not to quit. So, but, it, but at some point, adults have to take responsibility for themselves. Uh, uh, they can come up with a thousand reasons why, why they are using, you know, why some, something happened in their life and why they were mistreated. And, you know, while we're not responsible all the time for the first 18 years uh, or for what life deals us, we are responsible for how we play the hand. And at some point, it doesn't help to become a victim by always coming up with excuses for why you are the way you are. It's much better to say, if I don't like the way I am, how would I prefer to be, and then practice being that person. Again, you are going to become what you practice. So. Uh, but I think for family members who are having difficulty, uh, if they've exhausted all of their resources, they should contact uh, the professionals and, and bring them in and uh, let them advise them and uh, make some suggestions based on a better understanding of what that person's gone through. So how long does it take uh, typically for a person to uh, overcome their addiction, or does a person overcome their addiction? Uh, what's the process? How long? Okay. How long does it take to overcome asthma? Ooh. How long does it take to overcome high, high blood pressure? How long does it take uh, to, to overtake diabetes? Well, uh, addiction is a chronic illness, just as the ones we talked about, COPD. Um, it's, it's an ongoing disease that requires ongoing management. Now, you don't necessarily treat a hypertensive the same way on day one that you treat them five years down the road. Neither, neither do you treat an addict or someone who's addicted that way. For, for an addiction, you usually have the most intensive treatment first because it involves engaging with the client, showing them why it's th in their best interest to follow your recommendations, and then lay out a, a strategy for what they need to do to extricate themselves from the, the deleterious lifestyle they're involved in and to begin to practice becoming the person they want to become. We use groups, we use individual therapy, uh, we use um, uh, uh, an array of, of, of interventions. Our, our program has a basic core curriculum that informs the person about how they became addicted, what addiction is, what recovery is, and what they need to do to attain it. But we then have elective courses that are applied to folks who may have particular issues that aren't, that aren't, um, that everyone who's addicted is not involved in, but may have affected that person. For instance, if you have a young lady or young man who's been abused, then we may have special individual courses or classes for that individual. If you have someone who has anger management problems, we may have some special courses for them, or domestic violence, uh, or whatever particular issues they bring, we want to make sure that they're addressed. Um, everyone is different. And I think the clinician's challenge is to assess and be aware of the variables that the client brings, and to be able to match those with interventions that are effective for that particular client. So it's to match the variables that the client brings with the variables that the interventions bring and, and to, to, try, to try to achieve a specific and identifiable outcome. What we like to do in today's world is not just, you know, uh, say the person's better, we like to have measurable um, uh, out, outcome measures that can determine what, what they've done. I think, I like to think of recovery as the acquisition of a number of skill sets that enable the person to respond differently to things in their environment. Um, and so we have classes that, that the initial class might be engagement and, and, and it might be um, uh, support development, it might be decision making. We want to be able to, have, to measure what each class has accomplished in terms of providing that client or those clients with skill sets that allow them to move to the next phase. You don't go from phase one to phase two just by being there no more than you go from 
grade one in school to grade two in school just by being there. I mean, I believe it's social events. Mm -hmm. We want them to have demonstrated that they've acquired the skill sets we feel they need to move to the next phase. So it's not a time contingency, but a skill set, acquisition contingency that moves them through the program. And, you know, people often ask me, how long does it take? And I say, well, how long does it take for someone to go through college? It depends on how many courses you're taking, how much studying you're doing, uh, how much you've applied yourself to it. Uh, but they will not get through college and graduate until they've acquired the necessary skill set. There, there are no social graduations. <laughs> if that helps answer that question. Well, thank you, Dr. Cooper. Appreciate your time. It's been my pleasure. I think it's and your knowledge. Thank you. <laughs> it's a very important topic. Uh, uh, people are dying. Um, if you if you lump all addictions, including uh, tobacco, you know. Hundreds of thousands of Americans die every year from it. It destroys the lives of the person as well as the, the, the lives of the, uh, the family of the person involved. And so I think it's important that society construct a, or organize a, uh, a synchronized response to it. Not that docs stay in their lane and uh, pharmacists stay in their lane and the criminal justice system stays in its lane. I think we need to organize these things. And you see some organization by things like ores and other things that uh, pharmacy and, and, and uh, tools that can measure uh, uh, the, the drugs that a person has acquired. Years ago, a person could go to three drugs in, in the same neighborhood and get three different prescriptions. They can't do that now. So I think it, it shows that when, when society organizes and brings all of its resources to bear on it, you're more likely to get a successful outcome. And I think we're just starting that journey, and I think that we all need to be uh, diligent in trying to make sure that those efforts continue um, so that we can try to help people extricate themselves from this devastating illness. Is there a, another drug that's on the rise that may pass the opioid problem? There are. The, the first drug that was used for opioid treatment was methadone. It's mm -hmm. been around since. 47, 48, I think Hitler had something to do with developing it as a substitute for morphine um, um, back in the 40s. Uh, then the, I think the next major evolutionary leap was when buprenorphine came out mm -hmm. about 15 years ago. Uh, it's what's called a partial agonist and has some of the has some advantages that methadone doesn't have. There are also drugs like, like Vivitrol or naltrexone that sits on the opiate receptor and prevent someone from getting high even if they use it, so you use an opioid, so, so it, it protects them from themselves. Narcan will resuscitate someone who's overdosed on it. Uh, there's um, coming out now a, a um, subcutaneous uh, preparation for buprenorphine that lasts for six months. So I think there are, there are uh, uh, drugs, and I think it's, it's important to recognize that for any all the illnesses that we treat, chronic illnesses, uh, the ones I mentioned, asthma, diabetes, blood pressure, there's a role for medication, there's a role for the person's decision making and lifestyle, and we need to impact all, all of them in, in any way we can. So there are medications, I think, that we're just seeing again, the beginning of it, as we're able to identify molecules and, um, and receptors and, and develop medicines that are specific to those uh, receptors that are involved in the, in the process. Dr. Cooper, we hear more now in the medical community about genetic testing and seeing if a person um, is at more risk for certain uh, conditions like addiction. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I think like all behaviors, there's a genetic component to it, but it's very difficult to separate genetics from exposure and nature and nurture. I mean, if someone comes from a family that's addicted is that and they're addicted to that because of their genes or because they saw their mother and father getting high every day. You know, it's very hard to extricate it out. But, uh, I guess you can do some twin studies. You know, years ago I remember going to a conference and seeing someone flash a chromosome on the on the screen and say, this chromosome is what causes alcoholism. Well I think it's absurd. I mean you know, we don't have a a, a, a correlation uh, that identifies which chromosome causes behavior. There are, few, there are a few things where we can correlate with some morphological changes like Down syndrome and things like that, but in terms of complex behavioral things that involve decision making, I don't think there's any one piece. I think certainly the genetics play a role in it, you know, just as 
they may play a role in diabetes and high blood pressure. They, you know, they maybe you metabolize the drugs differently or glucose differently. But there's a there's there's a, um, a, a nurture environmental piece. But any way you look at it, the only part you can impact right now is the environmental piece. You can't change their, their genetic makeup. And, and I think that uh, that that's all we need to do at this point. It's a learning process, and if we can teach them to make healthier decisions, not just in addictions, but in, in medicine, generally speaking. You know, a person sees a doc, what, two, three times a year. They make decisions that impact their health, their, their health, every day, all day. And if we can't change the way that they think about the decisions they make every day and all day, we, we're having very little impact on them. I mean, studies that have been done that suggest when you talk to a patient in the office and you interview them half hour later, they don't remember most of what you told them. You know, and so a lot of doctors will write it down and, and they don't remember where they put the paper. So, you know, what you want to do is get them to think differently and to be aware that they, it's their decision making that you want them to be an integral part of their health care uh, in an active sense, not in the old days where you go to the doctor and say, fix me. You know, now I think the onus is on the person, and I think that medicine should be as much about a health plan, which involves avoiding uh, illnesses, early identification of illnesses, and how to manage the illnesses, and not just a treatment plan, which is a reactive thing to an illness having already occurred. So I think that 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 has moved forward uh, with men's care and with medicine evolves that that the the move will be toward involving the person much more actively in maintaining their own health and managing their own illnesses. Thank you, Dr. Cooper. My pleasure. Thank you, Dr. Cooper, for sharing with us. Well, that's all for now. Until next time, we wish above all that you prosper and be in good health.